Oh. The founding? Yeah, I've been reading all of Chernow's books. Okay, okay. So, um, I am a history nerd. I love history. It's in my bones. And history is so, as we just said, so important to understand where we get today. One way we can think about it is, and of course as a mom of an eight-month-old, I've been thinking about this a lot, is history is kind of like childhood, so I'm kind of obsessed about um, my daughter's development and making sure that you know she's she's learning what she needs to learn and that she's getting the things that she needs to grow into a healthy, thriving person. Um, and so we talk about so much how childhood, this moment, um, is so important in terms of moving forward. And that's true for history, and that's certainly true for U.S. history, right? So we think about the childhood of the U.S., what are the, the first kind of original sins? Slavery and the genocide and dispossession of Native Americans. And part of what, um, not responsible for, for either one of those um, developments or institutions, but part of what helped um, embed those institutions into our, um, our history, our culture, our society, are the kind of earliest remnants of police forces. So I'm thinking of slave patrols, and state militias. And state militias basically uh, protected white set were, were established to protect white settlers from possible retaliation among Native Americans, and slave patrols were responsible for um, basically upholding the institution of slavery. So slave patrols, so basically in the southern states um, until 1865, if you were a white person you had complete power to uh, police any black person, slave or free. So basically, if you're white, you have the power to arrest somebody. Um, you have the power to, in to confine somebody uh, because of the color of their skin. And, um, and these patrols, so people worked individually and people also worked in groups to basically um, reinforce the institution of slavery. The primary duties of um, slave patrols were ransacking through um, through slave cabins or dwellings looking for contraband, which included weapons or educational materials, because of course it was illegal for enslaved Africans to learn how to read. Um, also, patrolling areas around plantations, making sure that no slaves are trying to escape. And um, of course, dispersing slave gatherings, so preventing slaves from um, coming together, and, and the idea is right that this that the slave patrol would prevent insurrection. So think about think about this. These duties: ransacking or raiding cabins, patrolling around plantations, maintaining a kind of field of surveillance, and making sure that um, that slaves didn't have opportunities to revolt. So just think about that. This is like the cornerstone. This is the origins of modern policing. Think about. Um, what that might mean today and what some of the continuities might be between those three duties and what police officers um, do today. Okay, so again, in the South, no formal uh, police forces were established, but in the North, beginning in the mid-19th century, um, we do get the first professional police forces. And these were mostly supported by Northern industrial elites in places like New York and Boston, um, and the, their purpose was to prevent um, immigrant groups and poor white people and laborers from um, engaging in protests, right? And so again, you know, the, we, we think about the kind of pre-Civil War uh, mission of police as really being about protecting um, white property, protecting white property of, of um, industrial business people and protecting the property of slaveholders. This is the primary objective of um, of policing at that time. And of course, the, these, these systems evolve into um, what eventually becomes modern police forces, right? Okay, so flash forward, emancipation happens. One of the things that's always really fascinated me about US history is that there is like this kind of tendency that happens two times when, we, um, when equality becomes the kind of principle, the organizing principle, um, that kind of steers our, our founding ideas more so than liberty, right? Um, Civil War happens, of course, slavery is over. Um, this is like the first moment that kind of rights are extended, citizen rights are expanded in new ways, uh, unprecedented ways. And then 100 years later, which I'll talk about in a minute, in, eight, in 1965, we have the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, right? So these are two, the two kind of key moments when citizenship rights are extended to black Americans. So. 1865, slavery is abolished, civil war is over, and immediately, within two years, almost every former 
um, state and the, con the Confederacy establishes what is essentially known as the Black Codes. Um, and this regulates, although slavery people, formerly enslaved people can marry each other, they can enter into contracts, um, under the Black Codes, interracial marriage is forbidden, um, you can't, uh, young, young children can be um, captured in this system and forced to, to uh, pick cotton under um, a white overseer, um, there are, you, there are certain times you can't be outside, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these these laws, right? These new laws are invented that regulate um, the life of people who had just been enslaved. Um, one of the the kind of universal tenets of the Black Code is what is what's known as a, as a vagrancy law. So if you weren't um, if you weren't working for a white property owner picking cotton, you could be arrested. Um, and charged with vagrancy. And many people who were arrested in, during this period were sent to um, what, is, what is known as the convict leasing system. Has anybody heard about the convict leasing system or black codes? <laughs> what, do you know about the, what do you know about convict leasing? Basically, people were imprisoned for oftentimes very minor crimes, mm -hmm. vagrancy and whatnot, mm -hmm. and they were basically leased back to corporations. Big yep. thing in the South, I'm from Alabama, so yep. it was also known as peonage there. Yep. They were leased back, um, and huge sums of money, it, it was a, really an atrocity. Yeah. Uh, and there's, in my hometown, there's actually uh, huge graveyards where these folks were worked to death and buried and all that, and uh, they were kind of forgotten about, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and in many ways when people talk about comic leasing, well one, when it is talked about, I think I feel like this is a really important chapter in our history that we don't talk about. Um, you know, I teach this to my undergraduate students and 95% of them have never heard of this until they walk into my classroom. But yeah, a lot of people consider the comic lease system as being worse, by slave, worse than slavery or, or slavery by another name to the extent that um, under the for-profit system, the, the, the former planters, the, the new southern industrialists didn't have an incentive to um, actually provide for their laboring class. So as the chief said, um, many of the people who were caught in this system were essentially worked to death. Most people didn't survive um, for longer than 10 years. And of course, from the perspective of the former slaveholders, this was a way, after the Civil War, they they lost their labor force, they lost their fortunes, and this was a way to not only kind of rebuild the South, what's known as the New South, um, but also to help maintain um, their, their capital, their, their, their property interests. Okay, so this, so, so this is in place. And then of course, um, and this is during Reconstruction, and then of course by the late uh, 19th century, we get Jim Crow, Jim Crow happens. During the era of Jim Crow, or around that time, we begin to see um, disproportionate numbers of black people who are being incarcerated and arrested. And as black rates of incarceration go up after slavery, this then informs the ways in which um, people begin to talk about black criminality. So um, it's what my colleague and friend Khalil Muhammad calls a statistical discourse about black criminality that really becomes this powerful way to understand um, or for reformers and policymakers and social scientists to talk about black poverty and to basically um, create this really, really racialized view of understanding American social relations. So, um, so this statistical discourse basically um, becomes a way for social scientists and others to say that black people are inherently dangerous and that black people um, shouldn't live with white people because that then puts white people in danger. And this, um, and this discourse then fuels um, the kind of further penetration of, of police force um, and other ways that, uh, that, that black people in, in the decades after freedom are being surveilled. And of course that in turn um, leads to disparate rates of black incarceration, black arrest rates, which um, continues to fuel the discourse. So you see, you see what I, where I'm getting. This, this kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, it also is occurring in the backdrop of lynching that's going on in the southern states um, at this time. And we know that, um, that police departments 
um, in many ways were involved in, in, in lynching episodes, whether, um, you know, helping to release somebody who was accused of a crime um, to a mob, whether participating in the mob um, itself, or whether um, not um, enforcing or punishing the people who were responsible for lynching. So that's going on in the southern states, primarily, although lynchings did happen um, across the United States. In the northern states, um, we get kind of vigilante mob violence that is also similarly um, many police officers in urban cities like Chicago um, and Detroit and New York kind of turn the other way um, during, these in during these incidents. So, th you know, this is where we're really beginning to see the way the, the kind of the, the seeds of some of the tensions that, um, that we're very much dealing with today. And of course, this is happening in the context of the major migration of black people from the southern states to the northern states. How much time do I have left? We're looking at four minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> though. Now I'm just getting better about it. Okay. So I'll, I'll I'll kind of leave you in the in the in the real transitional moment. So I mentioned you know the second um, so so the first mass incarceration is convict leasing black codes. Second mass incarceration begins. The origins of it begin not when we re usually think, right? Not during Ronald Reagan. I argue. Um, not during. Bill Clinton's administration, the 1994 crime bill, but at the very height of progressive social change and, um, and the civil rights revolution in the 1960s. So when I, I, when I started this research, I, um, I thought that, that Reagan, that you know, if I was gonna do, if I was gonna think about federal policy and policing, and it was gonna be, the Reagan administration was gonna be where the story was, and I kept on having to go back and back and back through all of these presidential records to Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, um, in 1965, declares the war on crime, okay? One year after he declares the war on poverty, in part because um, of the, the demographic tra transformations that had happened by the 1960s. All of a sudden, many um, northern industrial cities like St. Louis and Washington, D.C. and Detroit were coming into black majorities. And because of the rates of poverty and unemployment in the segregated communities that many um, of the migrants we're living in, policymakers in the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration said, we really got to do something about the, this group of black youth who are growing up in poverty and who we don't we don't foresee jobs for. So let's we have to have some kind of in, of, in, of an intervention. That's where we get the war on poverty, and at the same time, or a year later, Johnson launches the war on crime um, to prevent urban unrest after. Um, a, an incident of police brutality led to three days of, of rioting in, in Harlem, New York. So, calls the war on crime, and this begins in 1965. Um, a what from between 1965 and when Ronald Reagan took office, a 25 billion dollar investment in um, unprecedented federal investment. The federal, federal government had not been involved in local police um, for the first 200 years of its history. So $25 billion investment before the war, before Reagan calls the war on drugs, into police and court systems and prisons. And the kind of bulk of that investment went to police departments, which received um, three out of four do dollars that the Department of Justice was dispersing um, during these years. And this is when we begin to see kind of a new mode of policing that's, that's, um, that's based on police community relations. Um, where police officers are increasingly asked to perform tasks that they hadn't historically, um, in part because the federal government is divesting from social welfare programs and investing into punitive programs. So we have that mode of policing being introduced that we're, that's, we're still, um, that's still alive today. Police militarization efforts beginning at this time, so um, transfers from weapons that were being used in Vietnam are suddenly being given to local police departments as a way to prevent future unrests. Um, new technologies, new surveillance technologies especially, that we see this is the beginning of the rise of the security industry as we know it today that the federal government invested in, and finally, um, data science. <laughs> so this is where I'll end up, the, the kind of the seeds of, of, of research and data science, um, the good and the bad, begin really, really in this moment being invested in. And, and so just to end there, the, in, in many ways I hadn't thought about CPE quite in this 
trajectory, but this is the very, this is the good. This is, this is what, I mean, imagine if CPE would have been doing this kind of work and asking these kinds of questions back in the 1960s, would we still be here today? Thank goodness CPE is doing what, it, what it's doing now. Thank goodness we're beginning to have these conversations about our history, and I'm hopeful uh, moving forward that this is, um, it's, a, it's not a moment, it's a movement mm -hmm. that is beginning around the country, but in this room right now. So, thank you. Thank you.